Hello, welcome to this ECE 102 lesson video that provides an overview of the engineering design process. I'll introduce the broad phases of the design process, and future lessons will dive into details on each phase. The first thing to realize is that there is no single fixed design process. This is not a step-by-step -step recipe. A quick online search for engineering design process will bring up many images or web pages they look different on the surface. A couple of those design processes are shown on the slide. But when you dig a little deeper, you'll find that most of these conceptions of a design process are essentially the same. They share commonalities like a circular shape or emphasis on iteration, brainstorming, and evaluating the prototype. Even if you go outside of engineering and talk to artists or teachers or landscapers, they will describe their process as similar to what I'm about to show you. Even though it makes it a little more confusing at first, I'm glad there are so many different representations of the design process. It helps us to be more flexible and creative by not constraining us to a rigid procedure. My version of the engineering design process looks like this. There are four broad phases, or the four I's. Those phases are identify, investigate, ideate, and implement. Each of these phases is broken down into two more specific steps. Under identify, we first commit to a specific problem. We need to know exactly what we're trying to solve and care about it before diving in. Then we list process constraints, or all the resources and challenges we have with us in this project. Under phase two, investigate, we do some research which can take a variety of forms, as we'll discuss in a later lesson. After research, we have a better sense of features we want our design to have, which lets us make a long list of solution requirements. Up next is Phase 3, Ideate. Here is my favorite step, brainstorm and analyze. It is fun to get imaginative and think of all the ways to attack a problem. At some point, we settle onto one top design. In theory, this top design should solve our problem. Which brings us to phase four, implement. Now we have to turn the theory into reality and see how well it performs. After sourcing the parts and building a prototype, we evaluate the prototype based on the solution requirements listed earlier. Although this design process circle looks fairly simple, it is never as tidy as we imagine it to be. The most important part of the whole diagram is this little arrow looping back around. After evaluating our prototype, we identify more problems to address. This kickstarts the next iteration of the design process, which will lead to another and another. The other complication is that this process is adaptive. We often need to jump back to an earlier step before completing a full circle. One example is that when you start ordering parts for your prototype, step seven, you realize you need to research what materials are available, step three. This might also cause you to add new solution requirements, step four. But don't be adaptive in the other direction. Do not jump ahead. I see this all the time with students and, to be honest, with myself. It is so tempting to assume a solution right after identifying a problem. That's a jump from step one to step six. Doing this causes blind spots. You might never consider valuable solution ideas. You might miss out on research revealing a common issue, and so on. Let me repeat, don't jump ahead. And hold back your teammates when they try jumping ahead. I'll conclude this overview with a big zoom out to the overall purpose of the design process. Consider, is there a single right answer to most engineering problems? The answer is no. There are usually alternate ideas that could be just as good as the one finally implemented. Even with the final design, we could keep refining and refining. That's the whole idea of the iterative arrow. Now consider, is there a wrong answer to engineering design problems? Absolutely! There are many. The silly example I write here suggests building a freeway overpass using popsicle sticks. That would obviously be unsafe. But a design could also be poor if it is cost prohibitive, or requires skills not available on your team, 
or takes too much time, or violates a government regulation? Hmm, so if we can't pinpoint a perfect answer, but we must avoid wrong answers, what are we aiming for? Our goal is to come up with an acceptable answer. We know we have a final design when it achieves the solution requirements, step four, under the given process constraints, step two. Note how those earlier steps are foundational for concluding our design. Without them, we'd be stuck in an infinite loop, always refining our design that is nearly perfect, but never quite there. But if you have clearly defined requirements, we reach a point where we say, yes, this is good enough. As a final note, I want to point out that this slide is an uncomfortable idea for many students. Most of us have been trained to look for the answer in the back of the book. We want to know whether we have the right answer, yes or no. It can be unsettling to stop a design when you know it can be a little better. But in my experience, the students who are able to handle this uneasiness, who don't need affirmation of their conclusion, are those who persevere and become successful engineers.